So today we'll be speaking about the art of Byzantine iconography and its sacred comp components and various theological references. Let's start from the beginning. Many people would have a question as to what is an icon. Icon refers, of course, to the Greek word meaning image. And in this case, we're talking about a sacred image, a sacred Christian image in this case, in that the icon refers to people and things that are not simply contained within history. So by, by that, we would be referencing a theological reality. The icons are oftentimes referred to as windows or doorways because they reference uh, people and things that aren't simply contained within our reality. When we, when we speak of an icon as being a window, we would suggest to you that it's not so much you approaching the icon, you being the viewer, but more that there is someone standing at this window and you are the one being viewed. But you open yourselves up, we open ourselves up to the reality in this case of a woman holding a child, which from the perspective of Byzantine theology is the central mystery, not only of, of Christian faith, but of, of uh, an understanding of why it is that we paint icons. That if it is in fact that the unknown, incomprehensible, invisible, uncontainable God chooses, condescends to enter into the material world, to take on a name, to be contained in the womb of his mother, then it is possible that we, the human artists, can depict this reality of incarnation. That's what we're celebrating in the icons, is the theology of incarnation, a God who chooses to enter into our world and become a human being, to take on flesh. The two primary truths that define Orthodox Christian spirituality is that of the Incarnation, as we have referred to in this icon, and that of the Resurrection. We would say that every icon, whether it's an icon of Christ being held in the arms of the Virgin Mary, whether it's an icon of Christ himself, as we will refer to a little later, or an icon of St. Barbara, or Saint Damien, or any of the saints in the calendar that are depicted in iconography, that all of them are reflections of this mystery of incarnation and resurrection. Many people on coming into our churches will see that the walls are decorated with various iconographic images, and they might suggest if it is not their own tradition to depict images on the walls, that these are pictures of dead people, all people that have died in history. Granted, maybe they've lived great Christian lives, maybe they've been martyred, but they're all dead. And of course, we would say, well, in fact, they're alive. They're more alive than probably most of us are today. We're sort of the, the half-dead. They're the fully alive because Christ promises, I am resurrection, I am life. And th those that have died, it is central to our belief in Christ that when they have united their life to his, they, they become filled with the power of the resurrection to live on. And so we depict them as being images full of light. There's no shadows in the iconography, which is true, sometimes makes the images look very flat. And, and that would cause some people to say, oh, you know, I don't really like the icons because it doesn't depict people in the most beautiful light. Well, in fact, what we're trying to communicate is the most beautiful light, a light that is coming from within the person 
who's been transfigured by that light that is Christ, as Christ says of himself, I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. So in the icons, we depict that theology. It's not just Christ who becomes light. He will also refer in the Gospel of Matthew to us becoming vessels of life. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And so in the icons, we depict our own brothers and sisters who have died in faith and become radiated by the supernatural light. And so you'll notice that there's equal values of light in the icons. This side, this cheek here is just as bright as this section here. Normally there would be light hitting a face or a human being from a particular direction and that would cause us to have shadows. So we're not able to really refer to three dimensions in the icon, but that keeps us humble also. That also reminds us that we will never know everything about God and about the things of God, but this is what we can know, and so we try to express it in our words, in our images, in our theology, and one of the ways that we express our theology is through color and form. It might be interesting and important for us to take note of the fact that the icons do, on the one hand, continue to convey traditional theology. So the images, Mary holding Christ in a particular pattern, uh, continue to be represented throughout the ages. However, there are cultural elements that color and change the form to some extent. So, for example, in this icon, this has some Hutzel elements. Uh, people from the Carpathian Mountains, the Ukrainian people that lived up in the mountains, and particular costumes that they wore, clothing that uh, they dressed in. And so, Mother Mary, uh, the Theotokos, and the Christ Child are dressed in those clothing proper to that people, as if to suggest this is also their God, their God who has come to be incarnate in their culture and among their people. And that Mary is, on the one hand, the mother of Christ, but she's also our mother through her mothering of Christ. Uh, then, in addition, like in this particular icon, this icon was decorated with something from the place where it is now residing, here in Hawaii. So it has a little lei, a dried lei, that has been used to decorate the icon. All of that is very appropriate for devotional purposes, which leads us to another point, namely that the primary use of the icon is to assist us in prayer. It is an art object on one level, and some people, that's where the icon and their observation of the icon will begin and end. For Christians that use icons for devotion, it is a means to assist with prayer so that our eyes are engaged into a relationship with this God who is incarnate in the arms of his mother. And then, like a window or a doorway, we can pass through the icon. We don't stop with the icon. We're not worshiping the wood or the paint or the gold. We're using it as a means of contact with the divine person of Christ and those who have been uh, Christified or divinized by him. So you will notice that there is nothing on the back side of this icon. We're not pretending when we paint the icons that this is the whole story or the full reality of God's revelation. This is an attempt on the part of humans to communicate what it is that we believe. And so in our prayer, in all humility, we can approach the icon and then we pass through it. We start with the icon. We don't end with the image. Because if with every icon that we have, obviously this is a very beautiful icon and very beautifully executed. However, uh, we... we uh, would still not want to say that this is how exactly how Christ looks in heaven. 
that's not something for us to possess. It's oftentimes when people ask us, are you saved? Of course, the traditional Christian would never ask that question because we never think of salvation as a product, as unfortunately most American Christians would do. We know of it to be a process, a lifelong process that continues to the moment of our death and when we are greeted in heaven by the angels and Christ himself. Every Christian icon, whether it explicitly depicts Christ or not, is a reference to Christ. Many people ask us, well, how is it that a Christian can venerate an image of Mary or John the Baptist or uh, St. Barbara or St. Damien, St. Martha and Mary or, or whoever? How can you venerate that image when only Christ can be worshipped? And we would remind them, first of all, that we don't worship the icons, as we said earlier. They are simply means of devotion that lead us into prayer. But also, we can depict the images of the saints because they, like St. Paul, could say that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So in a, in a sense, even when we are venerating St. Barbara, we are venerating in her one who has become what we would call Christified or deified. Christ and his light is dwelling and radiating in her and out of her in the iconographic form. But when we refer specifically to icons of Christ, again, we follow very strict forms that we try to be faithful to, but they're adjusted according to cultural norms or what was available to the iconographer in the place that they were painting. So different iconographers have throughout, even traditionally, have used different palettes for their painting of icons. In this particular image, this is the icon of Christ's face called the icon not made with human hands. And it's a reference many Western Christianers refer to, Western Christians will refer to the image of Saint Veronica holding the veil where Christ's face appeared when she went to go and wipe his face. And there may be actually a connection between the Byzantine devotion and the Western devotion, as there often is, not a contradiction but a complementarity between both Eastern and Western Christianity, that in the, the name Vera Icona, or true icon, we have a reference to the older Byzantine story that King Abgar of Edessa sent ambassadors or emissaries, people that would plead with Christ to come to Edessa. He was sick and dying. And he, he needed healing, and, and magicians and doctors couldn't help him. So it was that he came to the disciples of Christ, and they said, no, no, Christ can't go to Edessa. He must serve, uh, accomplish his Father's will by staying here in Jerusalem. But a cloth was given to these, these people who took it back to their king or prince, and he was healed because when the cloth was open, much like Veronica's veil, there appeared the image of Christ. And in seeing that face, he was healed. And this in turn would be a reference for what all icons are. When we see something of our humanity lifted up, restored to its proper dignity, we understand that that divine light is dwelling in us and we're healed by the degradation and the deformities that have been, in a sense, either that we've taken upon ourselves or others have thrust upon us. We've discovered who we truly are in the light that is Christ. So this icon, that not made with human hands, is a reference to that miraculous icon that was used to heal King Abgar. You'll notice in the writings, in small letters up here, which are a little hard to see, his name, I-C-X-C, -C, Isos Christos, Jesus the Christ. So we know that this is Jesus. But we also have these other letters from the Greek word, 
referencing that Old Testament story of Moses in the desert encountering the burning bush. The Greek letters refer to I am who am. I am the ever-existing one. And these letters help to remind us that the Jesus of Christianity is not a new God. This is not a polytheistic religion where another uh, God is being invented, but in fact this is the continuation and the fulfillment of the hope of the Jewish people that in Christ uh, the God who was present to Moses is now present to the, to the, the, the people that come to pray before this image of burning light.